Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. M- moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. Conservatives and journalists call out Facebook for news bias. FBI Director Comey says this is only the beginning of the encryption debate. And Catherine McCullough is my guest. Facebook came under intense fire last week, mainly from Republicans and conservatives, about a Gizmodo report in which some contractors who managed Facebook's news feed said they routinely suppressed conservative-leaning news. Gizmodo also noted the previous week that Facebook's news feed is managed primarily by Ivy League or private East Coast University graduates. So this really lit up conservatives, including Senate Commerce Committee Chairman John Thune, who immediately wrote Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg requesting more information on how Facebook curates newsfeed. That letter is just about as far as government can go in regulating speech without running afoul of the First Amendment. But conservatives weren't the only ones alarmed about Facebook's alleged bias. The New York Times' Farad Manju said citizens should be concerned about Facebook given its dominance as a clearinghouse for all news. Manju wrote that there needs to be more transparency about Facebook's news algorithm. Manju also wrote that since the Facebook newsfeed is personalized, there's really no way for an outside group to monitor Facebook for bias. But Tom Stocky, the guy at Facebook who runs Facebook's trending topics, wrote a Facebook post denying the bias accusations, saying he's found no evidence of the bias the anonymous contractors in the Gizmodo article were referring to. But conservative blogger Stephen Crowder wrote that Stocky and his wife have actually donated $5,400 to the Clinton campaign, saying this somehow refutes Stocky's statement that Facebook doesn't engage in bias. Seriously, folks, what about the First Amendment do these people not understand? The journalistic questions seem legit. Newspapers are essentially beholden to Facebook to get their content in front of Facebook's billions of users, so there should probably be some market analysis done there. But that's different from the issue conservatives are raising. The issue about Facebook's market power is an anti-competitive issue. It's a media diversity type of analysis. The bias analysis is purely about the First Amendment. And for years, Fox News has broadcast some really offensive and inaccurate news about minorities, about women, about immigrants and Muslims, and Republicans did absolutely nothing about it. So all of a sudden, we want content regulation. I really try not to editorialize here. But this is really, really absolutely ridiculous. This involves our civil liberties. And they're spending taxpayer dollars to haul Facebook into Congress to tell them why they're biased against Republicans. Give me a break. FBI Director James Comey says the government's pushback against encryption on the iPhone and apps like WhatsApp has only just begun. Under the federal government's various bulk data collection programs, the feds collect your phone data, including texts and other phone data, and stores them forever. With WhatsApp's encryption, though, no one other than the person you're communicating with can see who's sending the communications or what the communications even say. WhatsApp says even it doesn't know who the communications are coming from, since the users and content are invisible even to them. But Comey said at a news conference that encryption practices are, quote, essential tradecraft for terrorists and vowed to kick up litigation to allow the FBI to decrypt Americans' private and intimate communications using these devices and apps. Comey also blamed viral videos of police misconduct on sites like Facebook for an increase in violent crime in 40 cities. He says the video makes the police afraid to do their job. 
More developments on ClintonEmail.com. I'll just summarize them here. First, no one at the State Department can find Hillary Clinton's former IT director, Brian Pagliano's emails. Pagliano served under Clinton while she was Secretary of State. He's the guy who set up Clinton's private email server in her basement. He's also a key witness in the FBI's investigation of Clinton's use of a private email server to conduct official government business. So key, the FBI has granted Mr. Pagliano immunity in the FBI's investigation of Hillary Clinton. In another development, FBI Director James Comey has rebuffed the Clinton campaign's claims that this is a, quote, security inquiry as opposed to a full-on FBI investigation. Mr. Comey said he has no idea what a security inquiry is and that, quote, this is an investigation. That's what we do, end quote. And senior Clinton aide Cheryl Mills reportedly walked out of a recent FBI interview last week. She left with her lawyer. The Washington Post says the investigator reportedly asked Miss Mills a procedural question about how Clinton and her staff produce emails to the State Department. Miss Mills left the room because it had already been agreed this question would be off limits under the attorney client privilege. The Post reports that Mills later returned to the meeting. So the saga continues. And Comey says he won't rush the investigation just to to fit the presidential election calendar. The Pentagon is continuing to beef up its presence in Silicon Valley. The New York Times reports Defense Secretary Ash Carter was there again last week, meeting with tech leaders about artificial intelligence. Last fall, Secretary Carter announced his new third offset program in which Carter is seeking to use artificial technology to achieve, quote, military and technical superiority over countries like Russia and China. This would include weapons that fire without humans. The Washington Post reports that the the Pentagon is also overhauling its Silicon Valley office with plans to open another Pentagon satellite office in Boston. The Silicon Valley office, otherwise known as DIUX, or the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, has been open for nine months. But Secretary Carter is bringing in top tech talent with a depth of experience in cybersecurity, including reservists who work in IT when they're not on duty. Finally, the Charter Time Warner Cable deal is done. Last week, the last regulator that needed to approve it, the California Public Utilities Commission, gave the green light, and the deal is expected to close this week, making New Charter the second largest cable provider in the U.S. behind Comcast. Stay with us. For Washington Tech Policy Podcast listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And you can listen at the gym, in the car, on your morning run, at the coffee shop, walking down Connecticut, wherever you are. How about the third wave in entrepreneurs? Vision of the Future by Steve Case. You can download the third wave free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30 day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is Catherine McCullough. Catherine is executive director of the Intelligent Car Coalition. Ms. McCullough was raised in Washington and has worked in politics and policy for over 25 years. She speaks regularly on issues such as data use, privacy, cybersecurity, autonomous vehicles, driver retention, the government's role in technological innovation, and more. Ms. McCullough is a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, serves on panels for conferences such as South by Southwest Interactive, CTIA Supermobility, and CE Week New York. She's appeared on shows such as The Communicators and has published op-eds for Beltway Publications and is regularly interviewed by media outlets that cover connected car issues. She's an attorney and also holds degrees in journalism and political science. Prior to her work with the coalition, Ms. McCullough advised leading companies on critical public affairs matters and served as counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. At the Commerce Committee, she worked on subcommittees that oversaw many internet privacy, auto safety, insurance, and consumer product liability issues. Please welcome Catherine McCullough. 
Catherine, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. You know, I keep telling my girls who are four and seven that our generation remembers what life was like before the internet, and their generation will know what life was like before cars were able to drive themselves. This thing's really taking off. The Obama administration pledged $4 billion over the next 10 years to expedite bringing autonomous vehicles to market. GM is investing $500 million in Lyft for the purpose of looking at how Lyft can be a player in this space. Toyota's investing a billion. Tech companies like Amazon and Microsoft are beginning to look at new mapping technology. Google is well ahead with Waze and Google Maps, not to mention its own self-driving cars initiative it's been investing in forever. Last year, Business Insider predicted 10 million self-driving cars would be on the road by 2020. So I'm really looking forward to autonomous vehicles, but I suspect it's not going to be the kind of thing where I can just catch up on Game of Thrones with a bottle of cab in the backseat. So Catherine is here to help us understand more about how policy makers are approaching the industry. Catherine, can we talk a little bit about definitions? What is the difference between an autonomous car and a self-driving car? Thanks, Joe. That's a great, great question. You know, I think when we talk about driverless cars and autonomous cars, some of the language gets mixed up a bit. But the truth is, there is a spectrum of autonomous out there when it comes to vehicles. So the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration They look at autonomous as a range of capability where there is uh, an ability of the vehicle to take over certain functions for the driver. And they have labeled this range basically zero through four. And four is completely driverless. Four is kind of what you think about when you think about the Google car without a steering wheel, without a brake. Um, And that probably is the kind of situation where you could, you know, have a bottle of cab and and watch your Game of Thrones. But the fact is that before that happens, and and no one's quite sure when the technology is going to come online exactly, um, it holds a lot of promise where we hear it'll be here around 2020, uh, depends on who you talk to. Um, There are going to be quite a few applications that are going to be possible with that. But even before that, you have a lot of autonomous functions coming onto the road in the vehicles we have now. So we have things such as automatic braking, where the car is stopped before there is an accident because there are sensors in the vehicle that can sense when you're about to crash. Um, There are certain capabilities in certain vehicles where you can kind of hit a button and have a combination of lane keeping technology, braking technology, and other sensors that allow you to basically keep pace in heavy traffic at low speeds. And that's another level of autonomy. So there are a whole bunch of technologies on the road. There are going to be more technologies in the future. And the long and the short of it is, There's a whole range out there for people to take advantage of, and there are going to be quite a few societal benefits coming out of these technologies. And policy-wise, Catherine, let's talk about a few issues that need to be addressed in the lead-up to autonomous vehicles. Cybersecurity and distracted driving are both hot topics. How do they relate to the development of autonomous vehicles, and what's being done about challenges in these areas? We have a lot to think about before we kind of get to level four autonomous to get to that fully self-driving driverless stage. You know, there are a lot of advantages that come with that. Obviously, safety is number one. Most crashes are caused by drivers. But if you have a driverless vehicle, obviously, you're going to have fewer crashes. You're going to have less carbon emissions, and you're going to save a lot of time on the road. So that's that's kind of an ultimate goal. However, before that, you're going to have these various levels of autonomy. And within these various levels of autonomy, there are going to be kind of relative levels of ability to do something other than be fully looking at the road. For instance, There is a concern that in a level three autonomy, where there are these periods where the car is able to take over the driving task, that folks will be so 
caught up in whatever else they're doing when they're not driving, that when the time does come to get back online and begin driving again, that it'll be difficult to get their attention. And so there needs to be some work done around that. We need to look at different technologies and different fixes that can be used to get folks focused on the road when they need to be. And there are a lot of folks looking at this. Frankly, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on that will really make some strides in this area. And it's important because, you know, levels one through three are coming online as we're speaking. And so it's important to get these policy issues taken care of. So on cybersecurity, there's been some concern lately among some folks in the government who are concerned that, you know, all these vectors where data flow in and out of vehicles uh, are secure. And of course, automakers and the folks who provide connectivity uh, are concerned about that also. And actually, they've been working for quite a while on this. It's important to get this kind of thing taken care of because people should have the confidence that their vehicles are going to be cyber secure. And uh, there's good news coming up in the next few months, actually. Automakers have been working very hard in this area, both internally within the companies and then also working together to come up with a group of best practices in the area. And you're going to see some policy work coming out of the automakers quite soon that describes everything they're doing to keep consumers safe in vehicles. It's really important stuff and it's really great stuff. I'm, I'm really proud of them for, for working so proactively on it and uh, doing such a great job on it. And there was the GAO report that came out recently on the safety of autonomous vehicles. How will that apply to self-driving cars down the road? Well, self-driving, of course, will have to be as secure as everything else. I mean, I think self-driving vehicles are going to benefit from all the lessons learned earlier on and all the work that's being poured into autonomous levels one through three. There's, you know, there's just a lot of kind of practical thought that we want to think through before we can really get to the promise of level four fully autonomous vehicles. Um, and that's happening now. It's uh, it's really an active time when it comes to policymaking in the space. And uh, the folks who are heavily invested in making sure consumers are comfortable, including all those companies that you, you named early on, and especially the automakers, of course, they have the brand on this. They're the ones who have the closest relationship with the consumers. They are really making sure that everyone is comfortable with the security of their vehicle, with the cybersecurity of their vehicle. And of course, they want to make sure that people are being as responsible as they can be when they are in control of the vehicle. And so I cited that Business Insider prediction of 10 million autonomous cars on the road by 2020. Is that realistic? Can I start, you know, getting ready and saving, saving up? <laughs> you, you want your flying car? You want your Jetsons car? Yeah. I, I, you know, 2020 is the year that we hear. Um, we've been told by several companies that the technology will be ready in 2020. I have no reason to doubt that. The, there, I think there are some practical questions about deployment and the, the number that you cited there. Uh, you know, I, I have some questions about that. Uh, for instance, a lot of these technologies rely on sensors that read the roads. So they have a lot to do with kind of interacting with the infrastructure. And some of our infrastructure is not that terrific. We have to kind of work through the bugs, not only on the level four technology that's being developed, but also the circumstances that surround it. So uh, we have to, to work a bit on the infrastructure. Then there's also just the, the reality of turnover of the vehicle fleet. The average vehicle on the road is 11 years old. And so I think it's going to take a little while to um, reach that number that you mentioned, um, at least for level four driverless vehicles. Um, already, however, with levels one through three, 
we're already seeing those vehicles on the road. And the good news is we know that those technologies are saving lives already. In turn, avoiding accidents, of course, reduces traffic, which in turn reduces carbon footprint. And the same is true with level four autonomy with the driverless. You know, we don't necessarily need to have 100% level four penetration in order to get the societal benefits that we're after. So, you know, even if you have some folks say a 10% penetration of fully driverless vehicles, you're going to get a bunch of the societal benefits that we're after. So I think the, the moral of the story is that it's going to take a little while for, you know, your, your Game of Thrones cab in the backseat image to fully filter into our society. But we're working toward it. And I think everybody is working on kind of solving the kind of practical issues that are going to arise and I, I think it's a really important and good exercise because we are going to get so many benefits from these technologies that are coming online. I want to pivot to distracted driving because I can't tell you how many times I've been driving along and somebody's really slow and they're going 35 and a 55 and, and then you pass them and you see they're looking at their phone. It's like, of course. It's, it's infuriating. Like, how do policymakers anticipate distracted driving behaviors will change over the next several years? That's another great question. There are a few ways to get at this. Uh, we believe that there needs to be certainly uh, behavioral education. Folks need to just understand that they need to not be interacting with their devices while they are driving. Their job is to drive. Second, we think that there is a role for enforcement to play. Um, for instance, in the last highway bill, more money was allocated to enforcement um, against texting and driving. And we think that that is a really good idea. In fact, I think we'd like to see more enforcement going on. Um, certainly, we know that in states with stronger enforcement, there are fewer distracted driving crashes. So um, that's another area to look at. Technology is another element of this. Um, there are different technologies that can help drive down distracted driving. So for instance, um, a lot of interaction with the vehicle is becoming voice activated. With these new good voice activated systems, you're having more opportunities to um, have whatever interaction you're having with your vehicle, whether it's, you know, turning down the volume on your radio or whatever else you're doing without um, moving your hands from the wheel, without moving your eyes from the road. And I think that that's an important element of it, these, these, um, these technologies. That being said, we have to make sure the technologies that are being used, you know, really are um, pushing us away from distracted driving. Um, we want to make sure that we're not creating another distraction in the vehicle. And that's, that's kind of part of technology and technological adoption, I think. Um, you know, technology is just, it's a tool. And I think we all have to make sure that we are using these tools for our benefit um, and not to our detriment. And that means that we have basically some thoughtful, responsible thinking to do uh, when it comes to considering policies about technology in our vehicles. Catherine, it's been a privilege having you on the show. So thanks once again for joining me. I just want to ask you a few more questions and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? That sounds good. All right. On this podcast, we like to talk about policy and entrepreneurship, but also about what makes successful people like you tick. Tell us, Catherine, what are some habits, tactics, and apps that you use every day to stay on top of your game? Um, if we're talking tech, Obviously, you know, my phone is uh, the most important thing to me. My, my calendar that um, has several different calendars worked into it um, that I can share with my husband and that we can uh, work to, to use together, I think would have to be my number one, um, my number one tech tool. Uh, we, we literally have a calendar for each child and a family calendar and work calendars and our individual calendars all merged onto one calendar. And I, and I have to, I have to give him credit for that. Another, uh, 
piece of tech that we use actually relates to what we were just talking to. Um, we have a, a, a system where um, if I am texting my husband and I don't know that he's in the vehicle, he has an app on his phone that will inform me that he's driving and that, um, you know, he will answer my text later. I think this is a terrific piece of technology because it takes the pressure off of him to pick up the phone and to answer me. Yeah. And it also lets me know that he's in transit. And so if I'm not getting some kind of answer back from him, I understand why, and I'm not going to fuss with it. So, um, I try, I'm, I'm, I try to get my wife to understand why I haven't <laughs> responded all the time. So maybe I need to tell her about this app. It's, it's terrific. I, I have to say, um, I, I think, you know, he's often driving our kids around, so it helps keep them safer, safer too, is how I think about it. Um, and other than that, my, my main life trick to keeping sane in a busy life is, uh, is to try to get outside for exercise every morning. I, I'm an early riser and I'd like to, to get out for a, for a walk at least every morning, if not yoga or better. So, and tell us the name of a book that you've read recently that you're recommending to everyone you meet. It's going to sound awful, but it's a really good book. Um, book of Wonders, which is a story about the plague. <laughs> um, it's actually a, a fictional story about a woman who lives uh, in a village uh, hundreds of years ago in England and living through uh, a year of this village um, sectioning themselves off from the rest of the world as not to spread the plague throughout the countryside and what happens um socially in that village and it's actually fascinating um so i recommend book of wonders well thanks again Catherine, for joining me do you have any final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close and where can folks find you online thanks they can find us online at www.intelligentcarcoalition.org and the thoughts that i would like to leave are to think about this technological time we're living in when it comes to transportation in such a, a positive way. We have so much that's going to come out of this. I mean, lives saved alone, um, thousands and thousands of people are going to be saved by technologies, uh, autonomous, whether it's fully autonomous or levels one, two, three. Um, and there are going to be other benefits as well. So I think that if people can um, think about everything we're gaining from this and think about how much things are going to change, I, I, I think of it as a very exciting time full of possibility and uh, a time that I'm glad my children are going to see. You've been listening to Catherine McCullough, Executive Director of the Intelligent Car Coalition, which gathers leading stakeholders in the auto, communications, and tech industries to talk about policy issues, share ideas, build relationships, establish joint policy stances, and thought leadership and advocate for innovation in the connected and autonomous car fields. Catherine, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Joe. It was a real pleasure. <laughs> That concludes episode 39 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I can't do any of this without you, so thank you so, so much. And be sure and head over to iTunes and give the show a ratings and review. It really helps the show tremendously and will only take you a couple of seconds, I promise. And thanks again to all of you for listening. I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 